Welcome to the second panel of today's Free Market Roadshow. Um, four years ago, I was sitting there in my first Free Market Roadshow, and uh, there was not much of a big audience, just something similar to this, but the audience wasn't engaged as today's audience with uh, thoughts, feelings, and, and um, overall rash rationality around this, uh, this topic. And I must say that I'm really pleased that uh, Liberty Movement and the Free Market Movement in Serbia is gaining momentum and uh, this um, Tax Pairs Festival following in uh, a week is a uh, really nice result to sum up all the things that happened in the past four years. And I want to congratulate uh, Libertarian Club for hosting this event, for hosting that festival and promoting liberty in the past several years. Uh, for you who were not here at the last panel, my name is Paul Mikhailovic, economist, blogger, etc. And today's panelists uh, here, uh, we have a keynote speaker, Professor Ben Powell. Um, for me, Professor of Austrian Economics from Suffolk University, but later I, I learned that um, you changed your, your seat here now at uh, Texas Tech, uh, Director of Free Market Institute and also visiting professor in Rolls College of Business. Um, the most important thing that uh, I saw in uh, your curriculum uh, was uh, that you got your PhD from George Mason. And for those of you who don't know, George Mason is possibly the heart of um, contemporary Austrian economics thinking in the world. The biggest body of scholars, but more importantly, the biggest body of alumni who are promoting their thoughts around the world. Um, also with us, uh, the second panelist will be Terry Anker, a CEO, for, a CEO of Anker Consulting Group, which provides financial and management services to startup and young businesses in some industries such as retail, software, and even media. I believe I summed up uh, good enough. Uh, if not, uh, I'll let you Correct me. And at the end, um, great friend of liberty movement in Serbia, Dusan Miljevic, a Syrian entrepreneur with a long track of private business. And the most notable business that uh, you established was a publishing, um, publishing firm that uh, published many dangerous books that we are reading past decade or so. Uh, so really, really, I'm really, really thankful to your effort on promoting liberty with offering us possibility to read a most pronounced um, and um, formidable, important works of liberty scholars throughout the history. Today's topic is deregulation versus regulation and what brings the economy on the track. I will not talk much, I will just give you um, I'll give you opportunity to hear from uh, Professor Ben Powell about this topic and uh, ask you what can bring the economy back on track. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm very pleased to be here to talk to you about this topic today, about deregulation and how to bring an economy back on track. I should say at the outset, though, that Terry's already raised the bar for me because he whispered to me in the back of the room before I came up here. He says, hey, I didn't really prepare anything for this, so I'm just going to go off what you say. So you need to be interesting, uh, which I think was actually just his way of hedging. Of like, If I give a really bad talk after, he can blame it on me for not giving him the material. Um, but actually, the pressure has come off a little bit now because they just announced that they were handing out the internet passwords. So if you're anything like Ed Stringham, you're probably already looking at pictures of naked people instead of <laughs> paying attention to me. So now it's just free reign and I can relax and have a good talk. Um, so let me jump right into this here. So first of all, what brings it back on track? It's deregulation, not more regulation. In particular, I think this is universal of all countries around the world right now, but in particular, it's important for Serbia because so much economic freedom is lacking here. Currently, as we measure economic freedom around the globe, Serbia ranks 102nd. And of the former Yugoslav countries, it's last place out of all of those. So it's really important to deregulate here in Serbia to get back on track. 
So what I'm going to do today is talk about one example that did this and then make it a little bit more general about the role of economic freedom in promoting development and getting an economy back on track and then I'll close with some final comments maybe about Serbia. So one example that I think you can learn from and other countries around the world can learn from is what happened with Ireland in the mid-1980s. So here was their situation in 1986. They had big government debt racked up, over 100% of GDP, 116% debt to GDP ratio. They had a big deficit, 17% of the economy, uh, excuse me, 17% budget deficit going on at the time. And they had a really big size of government in their economy. The government was consuming more than half of all of the goods and services produced in the economy at the time. Result, they weren't as poor as Serbia is now, but by Western European standards, they were a laggard. They're about two thirds the standard of living of the UK or Germany or France. Uh, and when they got into this situation of 116% debt to GDP, they were worried, what can we do about it? We've tried raising taxes before, but we found as we kept raising tax rates, we weren't really getting that much more revenue because it was disincentivizing people to work. Uh, they were in the process of converging uh, towards the Euro European monetary unit, so they didn't want to do inflation. And they were looking at, actually I saw this when I came in here on the newspaper, IMF intervention. And Ireland is kind of a perverse case where the IMF promoted economic development. They promoted economic development by being so bad at promoting economic development that Ireland said, we don't want any intervention from them or any help from them. We've got to reform this on, their, on our own. And I would encourage you, I don't know the details of this situation, but generally if someone's like, I'm from the IMF and I'm here to help, you should run in the opposite direction. Uh, and I recommend doing the same here, like what they did. So how does Ireland address this problem then? So what they go into is basically, uh, a stronger version of the austerity that people are talking about for highly indebted countries right now. I should say you don't need to be highly indebted to uh, benefit from doing this. It's more likely though that if you're in crisis mode it changes political equilibria where you can actually get the politicians to change. Otherwise they just try to kick it down the road and keep their big spending policies. Uh, but what they did is actually bigger cuts than what you see going on in a lot of countries around today. So in 1987, and I should say by the way, there was no ideological shift here. The prime minister at the time was the same guy who was a big spender in the 1970s. It's just, it was crisis and he's like, I gotta do something and I don't want that lousy IMF in here. So what did they do? Go category to category throughout their budget that first year. Health expenditure, education, agriculture, roads, military. They abolished entire agencies, uh, Forest for Bathur is their uh, uh, environmental watch group. Uh, it, I actually think it's kind of cool too that they abolished regional development organizations. The organizations that are supposed to promote economic development in Ireland, they abolished a bunch of those and then they're going to get growth after they get rid of them. Um, so they do this in 1987. The primary deficit is eliminated. So they're starting to kind of slip out of crisis mode. At least they're not piling it on. They still have a big debt to GDP ratio, but it's not getting worse at this point. What do they do? They follow it up with even bigger cuts in 1988. Uh, cut current spending by 3%, capital spending by 16%. And then they kept these spending cuts in place. The economy started getting some modest growth, not roaring growth at first, but modest growth. As a result, by 1990, they got government non-interest spending declined to 41% of GNP. So this is a situation where they started off being about 55% of the economy, shrinking down to 41% of the economy, which is still 41% too much as far as I'm concerned. Uh, but in terms of real changes in the world that are going on at this time period, you've got supposedly you know, the Thatcher Revolution in England, the Reagan Revolution in the United States, but as a percentage change of the role of government in the economy, it's much bigger what happened in Ireland than in either of those two places at the time. Uh, result was, they're out of their, their debt crisis by 1990, they're back under 100% debt to GDP ratio, which is no hard and fast rule of what your ratio has to be to be in crisis, but a nice rule of thumb is around 100% and you're sitting in some pretty sketchy areas, which by the way is where the United States is now. So what did they do then? So the good thing was they did their reforms even after they got out of the crisis. Uh, the last thing that they kind of put in place was tax cuts, and I think tax cuts are really important. But I think too many people in the free market movement focus just on taxes rather than the real burden of government, which is how much it spends and how much it regulates you and how much it violates your property rights. We need the whole package. Taxes are a part of that package. Uh, but in Ireland's case, they were getting the rest of the package right and then the tax cuts came in afterwards. You see the top marginal rate was 65% before the period started. And this one, they did multiple rounds of tax cuts. So every year, basically, they readjusted the rates, both the standard rate and the top rate down. So that by the late 1990s, uh, or by 2001, it's down to 44% for the standard, uh, excuse me, for the high rate, and 22% for the standard rate. Also, corporate income taxes were coming down at this time. They started out at 40%. They were down to 24% by the late 1990s. And even that didn't apply a lot of places because they had uh, 
This actually, the, the bureaucrats uh, with the OECD hated this. They called it harmful tax competition because Ireland allowed a special 10% corporate tax rate for people who are in the Shannon or Dublin duty-free zones and for uh, people engaged in international trade of financial services or technology. So the OECD bureaucrats start pressuring Ireland, you have to get rid of this special tax treatment. They caved in and did, but the way they caved in was to lower everybody's corporate tax rate to 12.5%. So de facto, it was actually, uh, by complying with them, they actually got a bigger tax cut. Uh, and it was less distortionary then, because you shouldn't be tipping the balance in, in favor of any particular industry. Uh, as a result, by the end of the 1990s, tax revenue was 31% of GDP, and revenue, tax revenue was exceeding government spending. So we started at 55% of the economy, deregulated down to 31% of the economy in terms of what they're spending. This is a massive change in modern times here. Uh, and uh, compared to EU, only Luxembourg at the time was lower, and of course it's like, you know, that big. Uh, so this was an, an important shift. And then we can see what the results were. So Terry, you're still paying attention, right, for the comments? All right, good. I'm gonna get some graphs. I know you get like a little sketchy when economists start doing graphs and numbers, but I kept it to pictures, because I know you like pictures. Uh, so here is the, the kind of broader package of economic freedom in Ireland. So economic freedom measures protection of private property rights, the rule of law, ability to trade internationally, the size of government, which includes taxing and spending, uh, the stability of the monetary unit, and how much regulation of credit, labor, and business do you do. So Ireland was always pretty decent on property rights, rule of law was pretty decent from the late 1960s onward with international trade. Uh, it was really size of government and regulation where they start making improvements in the late 1980s. And the monetary unit was always pretty okay. What happened, they increased their economic freedom score. They became the fifth freest economy in the world by 1995. They had a little bit of backsliding. But what this got them was great economic growth. They start off back beginning of this reform period, about two thirds the average. You see as they're starting to make the reforms in the 80s, their growth's picking up, the trend line's closing a little bit compared to the other guys. Flattens out, this is the recession in the United States in the early 1990s. There's so much trade between US and Ireland, and Ireland so much smaller than the US. A blip in the United States kind of registers there. But then you can see by the mid-1990s, just taking off and surpassing the rates of growth in these other places, which also is really hard to do. It's one thing when a, a very poor country registers 10% growth rates for a few years because they're so far behind, there's so much capital technology that can go into them. Here you're already a relatively wealthy country in the world and you're still getting this massive growth rate really quickly. Um, so, is that all I have on Ireland? I guess so. All right, so the larger lesson from Ireland then, this broader package of economic freedom. Countries that are more economically free are better on almost every margin that we care about. So, most free countries, the quarter of the index most free, much wealthier than any of the other groups as you go down. They also grow faster. And this even understates it a little bit because we found that uh, improvements in economic freedom, regardless of how absolutely free you are, have a big impact on growth. In fact, the improvements are more important than the level of freedom even. So what you're seeing here understates the importance of economic freedom for growth because there's people in that third group there like China who aren't very economically free overall but have made huge strides in improvement and have big growth rates. So really the effect of freedom is much bigger than this on growth. Um, other things that you might care about, some people will say, oh, but it's just the rich who benefit from this, the poor get screwed over. No, so when we look at inequality across countries, inequality is relatively stable. What changes is how do the poor people in those countries live? The poorest 10% of the population lives vastly better in the most free group than in the least free. And in fact, they live better than the average in a lot of the less free groups. So if you're a poor person, it's not this trade-off of, oh, we can have growth, but it's gonna hurt the poor. It's like, no, over time, the poor get much better off in a more free economy. Other things, life expectancy, you're more likely to live longer. I like giving this talk in the United States to like business groups and stuff, because I'll look out at the audience, and as you can say, most of you would be statistically dead if you lived in a less free economy. Uh, but even, even Terry would still be alive if he was in a less free economy here, uh, which is good since, uh, we are in a less free economy, and I do want to hear his remarks, kind of. Uh, so this is the picture as we look around the globe. Economic freedom, you can see in Eastern Europe, there's not a whole lot of blue of the most free, it's more yellow, and so in the, that's in the bottom half of the index, and some green. Uh, really need to have improvements here in order to get increased growth. So we can look at some recent reforms uh, throughout Europe. So, it's probably a little bit of a misnomer to put major on here, but I have to, to me, major reform would be like what Ireland did or bigger. Uh, 
We don't have cases of that going on in Europe right now, really. So this is measured by a one-point change in the Economic Freedom Index score. It's on the scale of 1 to 10. And that's actually a fairly significant change, though. And it's enough to get you multiple percentage increases in your growth rate by doing a one-point change. So there's a few who have made improvements here. Romania, Bulgaria, Cyprus. Well, you can see the list. I'm not going to read them all off. Minor improvers, these are ones who have made some positive improvement, but less than a point. And then you've got negative ones whose economic freedom has actually decreased. Um, what do we see when we look at them? Major reformers grow much faster than minor reformers, negative reformers barely growing at all. If we split this out and do just Eastern Europe, basically the same story. Major reformers, there's less difference between the minor, and the, but that's just because it's a small sample. But basically what we're seeing here is as you make improvements in economic freedom, here in Europe and in Eastern Europe, it gets you to grow faster. Regardless, now remember, look back here, of what level of freedom that you're at. Because look at the group that's up there in the top. Romania, Ukraine, Albania, these aren't places with high levels of economic freedom right now. They're just people who have made at least a one-point improvement. If you can make a one-point improvement here in Serbia, that's enough to have a, a significant impact on how people live over time. And with that, I will wrap up and uh, say hopefully I've been entertaining enough to keep Terry awake so that he can actually have a few comments to share with you as well. Thank you. Oh, oh, yeah, and Ed, you can look up from your phone at any time. <laughs> so, uh, without further ado, adieu, I will give a floor or a chair or a microphone to Terry Anker and hear your notes on, uh, on Ben's ben, speech. Ben speech yeah. Exactly. Thank you. You know, I think what these guys are getting at is that I am a pr practitioner. Yeah, I graduated from school many decades ago, probably before any of you were born, and didn't have a single dollar. In fact, had debt from college. I borrowed money from anybody who would loan it to me so I could go to school while I was working. So I had to find a way to make money. Uh, I grew up on a farm in the middle of the, of the United States, a place where no one has ever gone from here. No one from the United States has ever gone there. In fact. I would bet $100 that I can get more people in New York City to know where, uh, where Belgrade is than know where the, the farming community is where I grew up. It just doesn't exist. It's flyover country. In other words, you look out the window when the airplane goes over and you go, I wonder if anyone lives there. Well, I live there. My family was raised there. My mother's one of 10 children. My dad's one of six. I have 60 first cousins. My grandmother always said that once she figured out what was doing it, she stopped, what was causing it, she stopped doing it, which seemed like a bad idea to me, but, uh, but I certainly understand. But my parents said, you have to go find another way to live. You have to find another way to live. They loved me. They, they had worked hard. Of my mother's uh, ten or nine brothers and sisters, she was the only one that graduated from high school. And the reason for that was varied. They all went into the military. They all did other things. But there was a time when you could live your life and have a decent life living that way. But time had changed. And so by the time the 1970s came around, my parents said to me, you got to go find something else to do, or you're never going to be able to have a family. You can't buy a house. You can't raise children. You can't do anything if you don't have any money. And so myself and one of my other cousins, he went into the Navy out of those 60 managed to find a way to go to school and, and figure out how to make money. And so this question about regulation or deregulation in my mind, because I'm not an academic, I, I haven't studied this my whole career, I've certainly lived under it. Right now we've got 11 companies uh, that, that, that I own. Uh, we have a publishing company. We own 11 newspapers, for example. Every one of them makes money. I, it's funny because people say newspapers are out of business. They're not. If you provide a product that people want, they buy them. They use them. They're important. If you say things that people believe are even remotely true, they'll read them. The problem with most newspapers is they're just so filled with bullshit, it's impossible to know why they even hand them out. Well, that said, so let's frame it in the way that I might, which is this word in Europe called harmonization. I would call it non-competition versus competition. You know, we could certainly say people need to be protected, but the challenge with those who might protect us is they ultimately become our jailers. You know, the difficult, the difficult thing for me compared to my other 58 cousins who still live in the same county where I grew up mostly, is that they chose to be protected. We all lived at a certain level in the United States where they would bring food and, and we weren't earning enough money so they gave us food. My parents refused to take that food instead choosing to grow their own. I didn't take the food either. 
I went and found another way to earn. So what happens is for a while, I was a little hungry. I was a lot skinnier than I am now. I look more like you guys than me. I ate a lot of ramen noodles and fish in a can. But we found ways to care for ourselves. I was constantly driven to be competitive. If you imagine uh, taking competition away from sporting events, taking competition away from writing, taking competition away from school. There are certainly universities in the United States now that have eliminated all grades. Everyone gets an A. Every person is graded as being the top of their class. The whole point is to figure out, uh, you, you know, once you're there, you're, you're, you're perfect. I don't hire anyone from those universities. One of them is Harvard. I just don't. I'm sorry, but the world is not absolutely equal. We're different. I'm tall and good looking. Ben is not. <laughs> That's OK. Ben has other qualities. I just haven't seen any. <laughs> But the truth is that in, uh, inevitably, I don't know who that woman might be, that there, but there is someone, probably Ben's wife, who would find him more attractive. And we've got to allow that to occur. We have, hopefully, my hopefully, we have to allow that to occur. Uh, my, my final remark uh, maybe gets to uh, uh, an example in my own family. My 12-year-old son, we, we live up in a, it, it, we live in a, in a, in a very safe place now. I live near to a city, I have moved from the country of course, but I, I live in a place where money can afford to create protection for your family and other things. That word protection I think is very important. My mother lives with me, my father is deceased and so she lives in our house with us, which by the way is not as awesome as you think to live with your wife and your mother, but it works out well for me. So at any rate, my kid comes to me and says, I want to go to my friend's house, which is maybe in the city it might be 10 blocks away, but we're more in a rural area, so he would have to ride his bicycle from one place to another. I said, wonderful. Your grandmother and your mother are out of the house, and so you can get on your bicycle and you can just ride to your friend's house. My son looks at me like I've, you know, encouraged him to walk into traffic and says, well, uh, aren't you going to take me? And I'm like, no, I'm not going to take you. I'm working, I'm reading. You're 12 years old. You're certainly old enough to get on your bicycle and ride to your friend's house. Well, he refused and said that he didn't know where it was. So I put him in the car. We're an American, so, so we drive everywhere. I drove him to his friend's house. I didn't let him out of the car, and I drove him back to our house and said, now you know where it is. <laughs> oh, he was pissed. He thought I was going to, you know, I thought he was going to stab me in the neck with a fork. I mean, just to, but I said, I am not going to carry you. My challenge as your parent is to love you, is to wish the best for you, is perhaps give you enough gumption, enough guts to know that you can take risk on your own and survive. If you don't survive, if something bad happens, I'll come and try to help you if I can, but the truth is I can't live your life for you. I'm full trying to live my own life. So the little angry bastard gets on his bicycle and rides to his friend's house. He comes back for five days, he's mad at me because I exposed him to all this risk, but he had changed. As a person, he changed. He now is much more willing to take risk. He's 17, last year as a 16-year-old boy, he lived for the summer in Japan by himself. He was on a school exchange program, but in order to get to the, the, the high school that he was attending, he had to take a train and two buses every day to get to school. Had no fear of doing that. So the question is, did I cause him harm because I didn't protect him from that, or did I give him benefit by, in a way that was thoughtful, allow him to assume the risk on his own? Those are my remarks. Well, wasn't that a fruitful remark? Thank you very much for that. And now I give a microphone to Dusan Miljevic, and I, I'm sure that we will have uh, Really, really fruitful discussion after that. I'm just asking for a Hi, Where is my presentation? Uh, it's on the desktop. Uh, one of the top. I think it's the one on the bottom. No one. Mm -hmm. Okay. First of all, I want to. Uh, 
I decided uh, to be different, uh, not better, because uh, I checked these guys out and they were obviously fantastic, so I had no chance on uh, being better, but I'll try being different in the sense that uh, uh, I'm a little skeptical towards the science of economics, and I think it complicates things a little more than it should, and I think that the real challenge is actually to be able to simplify as much as it can be, and not more than uh, possible, uh, those confusing issues. And I find it useful, I hope it will be useful for you too, to communicate through some great uh, cartoons. And I'll try to explain those that uh, are maybe not clear enough. I hope you can see this. Uh, we are told today that uh, capitalism doesn't work because private sector is just, uh, I guess, too lazy and uh, can't trust them and uh, you have to have more government uh, and government regulation. I just thought this is too good to pass by uh, because we're, we're being attacked all the time that uh, capitalism obviously doesn't work. Well, it doesn't work in that sense. Uh, my main impression on this uh, subject, deregulation or, re or regulation, what will bring the economic, economy back on track, is how can we even ask a question like that? <coughs> to me, that's the most amazing uh, part of this whole thing. Uh, from my life experience, it's so obvious and it's so simple and it's so confusing for me that uh, anybody could be having any kind of uh, dilemma on that issues that I really have difficult time deciding uh, where to start from. How do you explain uh, something that is so obvious? And then uh, I thought maybe I should try telling people all the difficulties that they had, especially in Serbia, which is the most regulated uh, environment that I did business with. And uh, it would be so boring and so disgusting and depressing that I gave up on it uh, very quickly. But uh, maybe part of the reason why people don't see uh, so clearly why it's uh, such an easy question is because uh, consumers are not exposed directly to regulation. Consumers don't go to uh, government, they, they don't have to read all these regulations that uh, exist, they don't have to uh, struggle with them, they don't have to go to government uh, for explanations or for permits or for uh, to study all these laws that they have to confine with. Uh, all they get is high prices and they get high prices because we spend in Serbia, I would think, maybe 70% of time thinking of government regulations instead of thinking of how to get things done. That raises the price tremendously. And uh, it might be uh, a very ugly experience uh, for us to, to deal with all these regulations, but at least we have no doubt whatsoever. Does it help anything or anyone, or is it uh, something very, very destructive? Uh, this is a slide that uh, explains maybe why I chose not to use economics, uh, uh, economic approach to explaining anything and why am I suspicious to economic explanations. Okay, this is about Keynesian economics which thinks that uh, if you keep on doing the same thing, uh, throwing money at, uh, at these monsters that never get fed up, that uh, somehow they'll go away. Common sense says it's just the opposite, right? Uh, maybe a way to help answering the questions to those that uh, don't have the first-hand experience would be to ask some of these questions. To ask back, do you get more done with your hand, with your hands uh, handcuffed or with hands free? It's really that simple. Uh, could there be any situations when individuals should be forced anything for their own good? It's really that simple. What are these situations? Do you, give me one where we could be 
forced to do something uh, because it's our good and we don't know it's our good, you could explain it and then we can judge. But no, you, you think you should force it to us. I'm su very suspicious about that. Can bureaucrats care for people as much as people care for themselves? I think that's very, very obvious also. Can bureaucrats ever know the needs and values of individuals better than individuals do for themselves? Each of us has a very, very different set of, of values. Our plans and our desires change from day to day, not to mention that we have different uh, points of view on life. Can bureaucrats better fulfill people's plans and desires by forcing them into one-size-fits-all solutions? Obviously, no. And, and this list goes on and on forever. In my view, the one and only proper principle to regulate people would be no, no initiation of force against a person or his property. And anything more than that is over-regulation. It's a very, very simple, bare-bone principle. But I think the moment you add something to it, you heard this principle. And you are not protecting these people, you are hurting what gives them power, what gives them freedom, what gives them ability to get things done, what gives them ability to be helpful to other people, which then helps those people be helpful, helpful to all the others. Violation of this very principle is the road to, to more problems and to a viral of, uh, disaster that we're all in. I like this uh, cartoon very, very much. It's an elephant with a shrink, <laughs> and he has a problem. Uh, I'm, I'm right there in the room, and no one even acknowledges me. I, I think there are so many elephants that we just fail to acknowledge. We, we refuse to mention them. It's some kind of political correctness. It's some kind of uh, wanting to not to raise difficult questions and uh, not to be judged. Uh, I will try to point to some of these elephants because I think uh, there we could have uh, the most profitable discoveries when we do acknowledge some of them. I like this cartoon also because it just explains what is being done to, our, to the population by the government. And if you can't read it because I hope it's too far for you, I'll read it. The one Democrat says that uh, when the people refused to hand over their wealth to the big friendly government, they became cold and hungry. And the other says, when the people refused to surrender their liberties to the big friendly government and don't pay for the big army, they were conquered by foreign evildoers. In other words, give us your money and your freedom, we'll take care of it. And my message to all of you is uh, if you will remember anything that I ever tell you, hold on to your wallets, don't give your money to anyone. Your money is your sweat, your life, your freedom. Don't trust easily with uh, any promises, especially when they come from government. I love this one. The kid is asking his father, Dad, I'm considering a career in organized crime. And the dad asked the proper question, government or private sector? And I noticed from my experience in life that the more government regulation, the more government organized crime. And the more or government organized crime, the more private sector crime. These things lead to each other, they feed on each other, and uh, very, very bad things happen. <coughs> Regulation has many unintended consequences. As government grows, private sector shrinks. Here, the cartoon says, find a government worker. One lady got hours cut, this guy had the pay cut, she got laid off, but this guy got the pay raise. When government grows, the private sector loses because the money that normally circulates to help people meet their common ground and co coordinate their actions on a mutual beneficial way 
that money disappears. It's being eaten up by government who is pretending to do regulate, protect us uh, from uh, all kinds of made up things. And I think this is the best explanation in one picture. Why is all the regulation bad? There is a house with a family behind all this maze of government meddling and regulations and people are asking themselves why is the price so high and there is a milkman trying to deliver the milk but he has to go through all these different routes he can't just go straight to them they can't meet easily they want to buy milk he wants to sell the milk but so many people sitting in government have to do something and have to regulate things and they finished all these schools where they teach them how to be smart and they start believing that they're smart and then they build this maze where you can't really get your milk delivered to people who, who really want it. So this is why the price is high. This is why I can't uh, do anything done because I'm spending most of my time trying to figure out how do I get anywhere to this maze. Why is overregulation so popular? My belief is that uh, voters are corrupt, politicians are corrupt, media is corrupt, educators are corrupt, businessmen are corrupt. All in all, we are all corrupt. That's my point of view. I don't say that we are very corrupt, <laughs> but we are corrupt. And I'll tell you for myself, if government decided to do another bad thing and uh, give me a grant of 100,000 euros, I must admit to you, I take it. So, as a business representative, I admit my corruptness. I just don't have good friends in government that would do that for me, but uh, I don't think, maybe, yeah, I'll take 100,000. More I'll take um, easier. This is another example of regulations, unintended consequences. When uh, people vote for, this is about alcohol prohibition in the United States. Some people have moral values that are different than other people's moral values and they think they should impose it by government force. That's very good for, for black market and uh, that's unintended consequences. This is about uh, education and I think this is another one uh, that I hope you will understand. Regulators and regulation corrupts education. And you are told that once you get your diplomas, you are ready to fly. But I think you should uh, remember what we were told uh, this morning. Maybe you should try getting some skills before flying. Diplomas won't do it. Uh, media, I won't even waste my time on that. Uh, and why we are so, I'll, I'll be very quick, why are we all so corrupt? I believe for two reasons. One, because each of us is designed to survive, to get ahead. So we are too indifferent for mm -hmm. others. And that's one of the elephants in the room that we don't want to admit. But we can't change our nature. But there is other reason. And that's that our political system breeds corruption by its very nature. That system can be changed. This is very sad. The United States was such a great country. It, it had torch of liberty, now government, government regulation changed it by some tiny lamp. Future outlook, I think, is very bleak. I don't think we should be jumping out of windows yet, but uh, it's, uh, it's about this. <coughs> we wanted nanny state, and now she wants us. She's drooling on our head and uh, I think we will be eaten up. I don't see much chance of escaping it. Is there a solution? I think that, in my view, we need to reprogram the system. We need to run government like a private business. Because who, who runs business like a government, he goes bankrupt. And if, we, if government, if we could find a way to run government as a private business, things would get done much better. Thank you. As I su suspected, uh, 
this was really uh, not, not very cheerful, but really interesting presentation of one uh, simple principle, and that is that regulation is an obstacle. And right now, I will offer some questions and thoughts before you to our panelists to try to address that particular issue that uh, regulation uh, corrupts and uh, harms economic growth. The first one is for Professor Ben Powell, and it's could the Ireland case be, um, be done in the United States today, and who, who can do it? So in the United States today, I don't think there's any short-run uh, prospect for reform like that. Uh, the current ideology doesn't fully support it. The United States has deteriorated over the last decade in its economic freedom, falling from being the second freest economy in the world in 2000 to being 18th today and continuing to plunge. Uh, I think where the opportunity will come in the United States is from crisis. So the United States is currently racking up an unsustainable amount of debt and unfended liabilities. Politicians are going to continue to just try to kick that ball down the road as long as they can. But when the moment of crisis comes, there are plenty of intellectuals and think tank workers and other people in the United States who have ideas about liberty to put this on the table as something to do. At that point, there'll be a prospect for it. But until an outside force changes the political equilibrium, I don't see anything much happening. If I, if I could take the liberty just to uh, agree with and maybe rephrase something that you said at the end of yours that I thought was really important. Uh, I think dealing with government does tend to corrupt. And this idea of government like a business, I just put it a little bit differently and said, what we need to do is get, take the functions that government does and take them out of government entirely and put them in the private sector so it is a business. And then if we get our governance, but it's not a monopoly government like that when it provides these other services, then we wouldn't have it be so corrupting. So I think it's important, but we can do it by just taking it out of the state, not by running the state like a business. But it's outsourcing, and I think outsourcing is a business concept. But anything that's not my core business, I should outsource. That's what I do in business. If I see that I can't handle something properly, I sell it or outsource it. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, I think, uh, that's the sense I meant. Yeah. And the other question for you, Professor, is, um, to reference on the uh, usual uh, counter-argument about uh, economic freedom as a uh, motor for prosperity is that uh, causality is different. Uh, I usually hear those kind of arguments, um, which stated quickly is like this. Uh, economic freedom doesn't uh, support prosperity. It's the result of prosperity. You are able to buy more economic freedom once you are rich. Countries don't get rich by economic uh, freedom, but rather uh, with uh, in, in government intervention, with regulation, with pumping uh, money into development. And then when country has democratized enough and developed enough, they put money to getting economic freedom. That's really usual argument that I get uh, as a counter for um, arguments that economic freedom pros promotes prosperity. Yeah, I think uh, that's an important one to address because it's absolutely wrong and we need to point them to history. Well, one, actually, the stuff that I was referring to while I was just giving you charts here, when economists do this, uh, they can also look what they call Granger causality tests. So they can test like the timing of the sequence. And they, but we don't need to go to all that. You can just tell a story. Let's pick poor places that got good economic freedoms and then became rich. Hong Kong was not rich when it adopted basically a British environment of economic freedom. It became rich afterwards. So we could just keep going and pointing to places like that Singapore or another one. And you can go again and again with it. And I think it's fairly obvious to most, or it should be fairly obvious to those who aren't willfully blind. Okay. Um, now I will turn to um, both other panelists and ask them one um, empirical question. And that is, how much time as an entrepreneur to dedicate to government and taxes to start working on its own business in the United States and in Serbia? How much time would you assess that you have to dedicate to unproductive meddling with, with government and regulation? Uh, I did some business in the United States years ago. I had no problem whatsoever with the government, but that was years ago. <laughs> I hear now it's quite different. Uh, when I ask my friends in the United States how often do they get uh, government inspectors to visit them on any issue, they go, we haven't had any, and they have business for, for years. 
Well, this was, again, information from a few years ago. I don't know how it is now. In this country, it used to be that we all, most of the time, had someone sitting in our offices asking for these papers and that papers and that papers and uh, let's see what you're doing. Maybe you did something wrong. It's presumption of being guilty of something and uh, constantly trying to, to catch you uh, in doing something wrong so that you, you can be punished because you are this bad capitalist. Uh, but besides the inspections, uh, uh, the, the time that we spend uh, trying to figure out how you get anything done with all these regulations and, and even what actually are, what do they want from me? What is it that they are requiring? Because the laws are written with the belief that the more laws, the better. It's really a belief uh, here and they, they're trying to imitate European Union that is hyper-producing laws and trying to regulate everything to, to the insane levels. And uh, our media and the politicians are, and schools are even uh, telling people that that's where the solution is. If we need to have order in this country because uh, everybody's doing whatever they want, we have to regulate everything. Look, they're doing what they want to do. So the, they're writing the laws and regulations that are even not clear. So you don't know what do they want from you. And finding out what do they want from you doesn't help you to hire a good lawyer who will read the law, because most lawyers here found out from experience, in order to know what they want from you, you go and you ask the government employee, will this pass through? Is this what you meant? And then maybe he tells you yes, and you submit your papers to get the stamp, because they always ask for some kind of stamps to have on documentation. So then three months later or six months later, they come back and say, no, you know, you, uh, he didn't uh, tell you the right. Actually, we want it like this. And none of it is written in the law. Or maybe it is, but God knows how to read these laws. <laughs> so uh, it's such a horrible, frustrating mess that my dream is actually to sell everything that they have and, uh, and move anywhere else because it's like working in a quicksand. You can't build anything on, a, on, a, on an environment like that. Thank you. Wow, that's uplifting. Don't you feel alive and excited and happy? You know, it's funny. Uh, it, it, it is uh, uh, every single day I spend a percentage of my time or I pay people a percentage of, of our income to deal with regulation. We have to record things for taxes. We have to comply with every manner and sort of, of idiotic rule from what kind of light bulbs we use. One, one of my favorite regulations. Uh, in the United States, we have rules that fall under an, a law called the Americans with Disabilities Act. Generally a good thing. We all know people that are disabled and need access to buildings. Well, the unusual thing is the building that I own for our headquarters for the company is not sufficiently large enough that it requires an elevator. It has stairs that go to the second floor. Not a huge problem. But the bathrooms on the second floor are required to be wheelchair accessible. So I haven't decided whether the, the employee is going to carry their wheelchair up to the second floor or once I get them up there, I just can leave them there forever. It just doesn't make any sense. I'm thinking, couldn't that money have been spent in another way to have advanced the cause even? But that's not the way that the regulators tend to work. I'll, I'll give you another uh, uh, example. W one of the huge advantages that we do have, at least now, although it's waning in the United States, is that there's regulatory competition between various states. So in other words, when you live in Indiana, which is a state that I live in, in the middle of nowhere, that's about six and a half million people, we can compete with Ohio, which is a neighboring state, or we can compete with Illinois, or we compete with California or New York. And as those states become more regulatory heavy, meaning that the citizens demand more protection, it becomes much more difficult for businesses to do business in those states. So what happens is that I have a competitive advantage running my business in Indianapolis against a business in Los Angeles, for example. In the last four years, because of banking regulation largely, we've been able to buy two companies, significant companies, companies that do uh, more than, than uh, $20 million in sales, uh, simply because they were in a regulatory environment that they could no longer be competitive. Ten years earlier, they were more competitive with us. The state of Indiana elected a single leader, one guy, who was able to be persuasive in talking about regulation and changing the nature of things, making this argument that I did to my son that said, you have the skills to ride your bike. You know how to look for safe for traffic. You know how to make yourself safe. Now just go do it. And this individual leader in our state drove our citizens that way as well. 
said that we can reduce these regulations and we're not going to die in the streets. Bad things are not going to happen. If they do, we'll adjust and correct and fix if we need to. But there's no reason to believe that these things are going to happen. In fact, there's all sorts of evidence that would support the idea that we'll be more competitive. So now, California, those jobs have moved to Indiana. Those people either moved to Indiana or they stayed in California and remained unemployed. It's what happens here. The thing that concerns me the most about the regulatory environment with, the, with Europe, with, the, with a flat Europe, is that it's inconceivable that the big players will play fair. It's inconceivable that anyone in France, any elected official will say, you, my constituents who get to vote for me, should do without so that someone who lives far away and wears a rugby jer jersey that's different from our own will get the advantage of this relationship. That will not happen. It will not happen. The only way that we can truly be competitive or manage it is by claiming the advantage or the right ourselves. Deregulate. Create a competitive advantage. Those jobs will come here. You take them. You dole them out. You decide how they're expended. But the challenge of someone else telling you how to regulate is that they will always create an advantage for themselves. I certainly would. We have uh, 15 more minutes. Uh, 12. Uh, so I would uh, now offer you to ask uh, questions to our panelists. It's, uh, you don't need a comment. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a great rule. If, if, I, if I make a mistake in my business and I file a, a form, my tax form, and I do something incorrectly, I can go to jail. If a government official makes an error and, and kills 100,000 people or loses $100 billion, the worst that can happen is they lose their job. They still get their pension. They still get health care benefits. My family would lose their home. It's just a very different kind of a sense of peril. It's inconceivable to me that someone who doesn't have that kind of risk will invest as well or as attentively as I do. If we, even in this room, if, if I said to you, we all put on shock collars like you would use on a dog to train them, and I said, if you say something I don't like, I'm going to push that button and cause you pain, it would change the mood in this room tremendously if I had that button and Ben did not. I wouldn't give it to Ben, by the way. But whoever has that button controls the mood of the room. It's silly. It's wrong. How would we ever give that button to a single person and not believe them to become corrupt? I would use the word self-interested, not corrupt. I think that we all are self-interested. And that's OK. My son, at 12, wanted me to drive my car and take him to his friend's house. I wanted to stay home and read. We both had self-interest. There's not a problem in the fact that, that people have self-interest. The problem is when one person has all of the power and uses that to advance themselves. In the United States right now, the taxing authority, the Internal Revenue Service, as they call it, recently has been discovered to have been intentionally making it more difficult by taxation on people who oppose President Obama's policies. That's astonishing. That's a horrifying crime. But they were using that. I don't know that they were necessarily big advocates for Barack Obama. I don't think they were necessarily Democrats. I think that they were afraid that these people might challenge their jobs. And so they're thinking about their own children. They're thinking about their own mortgage. They're thinking about their own desire to have a better car or a better ink pen. And they're afraid of people who might challenge their way of life. It's self-interest. I feel better about it knowing that it exists and it changes the way that I think. Whenever someone promises to protect you, find out what it is that they want. It is, perhaps. Just more optimistic. I have a question for Ben. Uh, ben, you showed us the case study of Ireland and how much progress they made in the 1990s. And yet today, Ireland is one of the pigs. And uh, uh, 
So what happened, and are the problems it's having short-lived or longer-term, in your view? Yeah, so Ireland's reform story stops at 2000. They failed to continue to improve their economic freedom, and they actually backslid a little bit. Uh, but then their more recent uh, fluctuation has been the worldwide same one that everybody's experienced. Their, their tie to the U.S. economy is very tight. It's something on the order of about $50,000 per Irish person invested in Ireland from the United States. So any sort of macroeconomic cycle that we get, we're going to trans transmit a lot of it to them. Uh, I do hear, and I haven't studied the most recent thing in depth at all, but I hear that they're making cuts now just like they did before. And if that's the case, I think it's good news for the future, but I don't know if it'll sustain and I haven't looked at it closely. Um, are there any more questions? Well, if not, I would like to take a few, few more minutes from you and uh, make a closing remark with uh, stating that um, the predominant thought we uh, heard right now was uh, one way of looking at the government regulation which is basically led by collusion, corruption, or uh, interest-led action, and basically people using power to impose rules that benefit themselves uh, uh, on others. But there is also other view, and it's really important, I think, to stay right here, is that um, some other interests that um, push people on working on regulations, especially politicians, his beliefs, a set of morals. And uh, I do believe that um, current result, the current state of the regulation, is basically a flux of all interest um, interweaved on a political market. That means that all political interest parties, individuals, and individuals representing some other groups are interacting between each other, presenting their interests both financial, moral, or self-interest in any other way. So maybe the question if deregulation or regulation should be done, and that would be the exit for, for this crisis, and if we agree that deregulation is the way, then the answer is try to persuade people, try to change moral code, try to change informal institutions that make the predominant belief that is leading politicians on ruling regulations that they believe are right. So therefore, thank you for coming here at Free Market Road Show, because that is exactly what has to be done to change institutions. And the next step is spread the word. So with that, I call you for coffee break, and we'll see each other on the third panel. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.